Before there was an Indianapolis prize, there was a dream. A dream with a singular purpose. To awaken the world to the efforts of its most accomplished conservationists. People making great sacrifices to save endangered wild animals and wild places. They're a rare breed, these people. Incurably optimistic. Undaunted by danger. Unwilling to quit. The dream then was to honor them with a prize worthy of their efforts, as well as a platform from which to promote their cause. In 2006, with support from the Eli Lilly and Company Foundation and other community leaders, the Indianapolis Prize was established as the world's largest monetary award for animal conservation. But the real victory happens in the field because what these winners prize above all else is preserving the planet for generations to come. And with each new winner, new hearts and minds are one. What began as a dream is now a dynamic force in the fight to save wild things and wild places everywhere. And today, it's no longer just a prize, but a promise. A promise for a better world. One where all animal life is honored and respected. Where everyone is inspired to make a difference. Where we make every effort to save our vital ecosystems. Where conservation is part of the daily conversation. Where the value of wildlife is globally recognized. Thanks to this year's finalists and the finalists and nominees of years past, we are inspired. We will make a difference. This is the Indianapolis Prize. With those powerful words and images, tonight we hope to inspire you. We hope to motivate you and educate you about the future of our planet. Good evening from the Indianapolis Zoo. I'm John Stair. You're going to see the incredible stories of six people who are making a difference in this world. They pour their hearts, their time, and their minds into saving species. The men and women you'll meet are finalists for the 2016 Indianapolis Prize, one of the most prestigious awards in conservation. We hope seeing their stories will start a conversation about conservation. Over the next hour, we'll take you around the world to some of the most exotic locations and some of the loneliest places on Earth. You'll see the impact these six conservationists have made in the communities where they work and on the animals and environments they're trying to save. We begin in the flights of fancy aviary because the winner of the Indianapolis Prize got his start working with birds. Carl Jones is one of very few people who can actually say he has saved a species from extinction. In fact, he has brought a number of animals back from the brink on a small remote island off the African coast. I like to think about what the world is going to be like about 100 years into the future. What do we want Mauritius to look like? Without nature, we become lesser human beings. We really do need to have beautiful things around us and natural things around us. Every individual on this world can make a difference and we can go out there and we can actually achieve our dreams. And this pair have a second brood. This is one of the latest chicks we've ever had. So if you can bring it down, we can then have a closer look at it. Carl is a, a natural philosopher. He's a biologist. He's a sociologist. Yeah. He's able to draw on his innate understanding about how systems work, how human systems work. We end up with influences that are not just affecting you know, a few species on Mauritius, but are starting to influence the whole world. Wow, isn't that just beautiful? He's done all the field work. He's encountered all the problems. Seeing how you can change things, it's just what drives him. It's completely innate. From an early age, Carl Jones seemed to be hardwired to help animals thrive. Born and raised in Wales, his backyard became his own private zoo. I had so many animals in my back garden that I had to play truant to be able to look after them. I used to slip home early so that I could look after my birds. 
Carl's mum would have to go through his pockets picking out slugs and snails. And, and from a fairly early age, people brought him injured animals. One of Carl's early heroes was the legendary wildlife author Jerry Durrell, who pioneered the captive breeding techniques Jones had practiced at home. When he was still a graduate student, Durrell's Wildlife Conservation Trust hired Jones to run a project on the tiny East African island of Mauritius. The island's ecosystems were reeling from centuries of human intervention. Where most saw a lost cause, Jones saw a possibility. And then one day I heard about the plight of the Mauritius kestrel, which in 1974 was the world's rarest bird. Only four individuals were left. And I thought, I can save that. I know how to breed kestrels. Eminent scientists, particularly around the kestrel, they were saying, don't do this species. It's a species without hope. Carl Jones painstakingly reared the last pair of kestrel eggs on the island back from the brink. And it worked populations began to rebound and today the kestrel is thriving and breeding in the wild. Jones has since been credited with saving more than a dozen bird, mammal and reptile species. But he realized simply saving species was not enough. In the long run, wildlife doesn't have a chance without a healthy home. So what we're doing is restoring the island to beautiful blue eggs. 35 years ago, they found barren islands, devoid of species. This is where we've been releasing seabirds. This is a white-tailed tropic bird. And in some cases where there's missing species, such as the giant tortoises, we bring back ecological replacements, extant species that can fulfill the role of the extinct ones. We look at islands that are now teeming with life, which is absolutely incredible. Oh, look, there's some tortoises here. Oh, and one of them's Big Daddy. We don't know how, how old Big Daddy is, but he's clearly well over 100 years old. Carl's work with the Kestrel resulted in creations of Mauritius' first national park. We have not only species being recovered, but now whole systems being recovered. After over 40 years of work on the island, Jones' model for sustainable conservation is a success story of which the rest of the world has taken note. Ah, here we are. Oh, look, there's a bird there. So you're going to go up and have a look? Yes, I am. Fantastic. And so this is the, the great legacy of, of Carl. We have people that come from all, uh, all the corners of the world who then are seeding these ideas and actually getting them these ideas to grow elsewhere. Carl has inspired a lot of Mauritians. And he always tell us that conservation takes decades, take time to achieve, but he does keep to it and he make us all believe that we will. Carl Jones has spent the best years of his life working toward the safeguarding of our biodiversity. And so we're grateful to have been a country that has uh, turned back. We have positive things to show for. We owe a lot of credit to the work of Carl. He's achieved what most people would stand back and say is impossible, to be able to say that that person has actually saved a number of species. I lived in Mauritius for 20 years, and a lot of people would say to me, why have you come back to Wales? <gasps> well, it's my home, and it's where I feel really comfortable. I didn't become a dad until quite late in life. I've become a very different person since I've had my children. It's tremendous to see them grow up, getting the same delight that I get from the natural world. He's got a bit more time to spend with the kids, watching them just like he does the birds. I think the more he talks, the more he inspires, and it's something for them to take on. Huge pride in what he's done for the future. Training and inspiring the next generation of conservationists is at the heart of Carl's work. In the last 30 years, more than 800 people have trained alongside him. 
Now, the zoo says when people come within an inch of an orangutan, they feel an emotional connection and an empowerment to help. We now know how habitat loss, poaching, and other human behaviors can affect animal populations. And when one species is lost, it affects an entire ecosystem. So what can you do to join the prize heroes to help save what's already here? Get started by just being aware of how what you do affects the planet. Go out and explore nature. Take a moment, stop, look around you, enjoy the outdoors. And finally, get involved. Find a cause that really means something to you and take action. Figure out what you can do to help save species. The Indianapolis Prize website is a great place to learn about the efforts to save animals around the world. Maybe you'll find something there that piques your interest to take the first step to get involved. You can read all about the Indianapolis Prize finalists and how they got started. Just go to indianapolisprize.org. Conservation isn't only about the plants and animals that are right in front of us. Sometimes it's about the things we can't see. Rodney Jackson is a man who has traveled extensively and worked through huge obstacles to protect an animal that even he has only seen a few times in the wild. He's the mildest mannered Indiana Jones you will ever meet in your life. He is also incredibly tenacious. And it's that quality, really, I think, that has seen him through some really difficult times. Rodney Jackson has devoted his life to conserving one of the most beautiful, elusive, and captivating of all the world's predators. I just knew from when I was probably 10 years old, or maybe even younger, that I really wanted to be a wildlife biologist. That was my dream. For more than four decades, he has pursued that dream among the high mountains of Asia with one goal, to save the snow leopard. From the beginning, it was a daunting undertaking. You've got such a cryptic, uh, I mean, almost a ghost-like cat, right, that never shows itself, and it's most happy when it sees you and you don't see it. Snow leopards live at high elevation, generally above 12,000 feet. This brings real problems to me because I really fear heights, actually. <laughs> but that's what you have to do. You have to do it. Just learning the most basic information was a huge challenge. In the 1980s, Jackson pioneered radio tracking of the cats and used camera traps to capture some of the first ever images of snow leopards in the wild. It was an extraordinary achievement, given the primitive technology and the harsh conditions. Rodney's climbed up ice rivers in the middle of the winter and had the ice break through, and he's been bitten by a snow leopard where he was a two-week walk from medical care. To see the snow leopard, you have to go in the dead of winter. You have to sleep in a tent in temperatures down 20 below zero. The study that we did in Nepal in the 1980s, we ended up being snowbound in a little two-person camping tent for seven weeks. Our goal here is to protect the core areas, the green areas, and to start linking these isolated areas. The hard-earned data from basic research was the foundation of Jackson's work. But in the decades since, he has broadened his approach. In 2000, Jackson founded the Snow Leopard Conservancy with an emphasis on grassroots conservation. With snow leopards, they range over huge territory, over 12 different countries. What you've really got to do is change a culture. And that's been Rodney's approach. Work with local people, village by village. Let's develop solutions that benefit both. Snow leopard sometimes comes along the trail right into the village, and it sees the livestock in the little enclosure. The, I think the only way to protect snow leopards is to alleviate the human-wildlife conflict that results from the killing of livestock. I mean, livestock is essentially the people's cash in the bank. Rodney saw corral predator proofing as one of the biggest needs for saving the cats. And that's going to go a long way to helping the local people live in better harmony with the cats. Jackson's work with local communities goes much further. To change attitudes as he works in Mongolia, he's teaming up with community leaders who can exert a powerful influence for change. The shamans and the sacred site guardians are important, not only for us in terms of being a connection to the snow leopard world, but they're just good spokespeople in their communities for conserving this animal. 
I'm very encouraged. I really think that we are probably not far off the day when snowleopards can be taken off the endangered species list. I really need to be working on mentoring the next generation of snowleopard conservationists, and, and that's going to be my goal for the next 10 years. He's not going to quit. He's not going to stop going until he has to. That's his nature, and that's the way he is. He's lived his dream. When he was that little kid, he dreamed of doing what he's doing right now. How lucky he is to be able to do that. Rodney was first nominated for the Indianapolis Prize in 2008. This is his fourth nomination, a great record of getting his work recognized around the world. Now you saw the rough terrain Jackson had to go through just to be where the snow leopards might be. Now imagine a camera crew traveling with him and all the other finalists to document their field work for these stories. It is a photographer's dream job. Matt Mays is the producer, writer, and director of all the stories you're seeing tonight. He and his crew travel to some stunning locations off the coast of Africa, to Wales, to Portugal, and many places in between. They traveled 100,000 miles over three months to tell the incredible stories of these six heroes of conservation. Every one of the finalists spends a big part of their time outdoors, tracking animals or traveling to communities affected by their work. We want to take you along with Joel Berger, who works in some of the most remote places on Earth to preserve the animals who live there. People don't see muskox. They stand, they stand. We can watch the wind blow. We can watch the snow coat them. A species that's been there for a quarter of a million years. But when you see black dots scattered across the hillside, there is magic. For more than four decades, Dr. Joel Berger has worked his magic to preserve species and landscapes in every corner of the planet. With a heavy focus on migratory animals, Berger's research has shown the importance of these species to our planet. He just wants to be out there doing the work and, and saving these species, saving these landscapes. He's advancing our ability to look at whole systems, to look at truly a global issue. For the last decade, he has worked in the most perilous regions of the Siberian Arctic on a study of muskox populations. Well, muskox are very similar to polar bears in that they are kind of a flagship species for climate change. They are feeling, certainly, the heat. So as we've been watching climate change occur at the top of the world, changing two to three times faster than the Earth's average, the opportunities for the muskox to go north further are gone because there's no more land. Never afraid to challenge the status quo, Berger has tested the limits of the Namibian government while working to save the African country's black rhino populations in the early 1990s. Black rhinos were being slaughtered. There were probably, by the late 1980s, there were maybe 3,500 left. And Namibia didn't have the financial resources for anti-poaching patrols. The Namibian government decided to cut off the horns, the idea being, what's a rhino without a horn? And you know why we take the horns off of some of the rhinos? Because poachers can shoot it. The most important conclusion of his research was the dehorned rhinos were unable to protect their young from the local predators. The reproductive success plummeted with these dehorned rhinos. You have to be a really brave whistleblower to say something that you know might actually get you expelled from the country. But he knew that that was the more important story to tell. He wasn't afraid to tell it. That led to a bit of a storm, and we were eventually kicked out of the country. So we left under this veil. And it was very controversial. Berger would challenge the state of Wyoming when his research revealed that over 70% of the pronghorn migration lands had been lost in the Grand Teton National Park. Development by oil and gas companies was threatening to take that number even lower. If the migration corridor was severed, that animal would go extinct in the national park. We collected over 11,000 data points through the pronghorn's eyes as they were moving through 
the landscape. And then conservation movements stemmed from that information. Pronglar left the winter range, and they're on their way back this direction. It's an insurmountable mountain getting the, the numbers of individual groups together, private sector to public, to talk about an issue of migration of a species. It doesn't take long to realize his agenda is actually quite out there in front. I'm here for the conservation of wild species. Dubbing the region the path of the pronghorn, Berger preserved portions of a 350-mile section of terrain, creating what is now the only protected corridor in the United States. Here's a guy who's in his early 60s. Most people slow down a bit, but Joel has got so much energy, so much drive. He carries pictures in his wallet of the different animals he's working on so he can show people when he talks about them. How do we go from caring to trying to do something. I like to do it because the animals are still there. I hope other people want to do it because the animals are still there. Joel's latest products in India and Mongolia are helping balance human livelihoods with conserving wild species. The conservationists who have won the five previous Indianapolis Prize Awards are all trailblazers in their fields. Carl Jones is in some good company. The first winner in 2006 was George Archibald, who heads the International Crane Foundation. The following winner was George Schaller of the Wildlife Conservation Society. And in 2010, Ian Douglas Hamilton, the founder of Save the Elephants. The winner of the 2012 Indianapolis Prize was Stephen Anstrup, the chief scientist at Polar Bears International. Well, I'm here with the 2014 winner of the Indianapolis Prize, Pat Wright. Welcome back to Indianapolis. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. So tell me what the last two years have been like. Busy, amazing. It's just amazing the things that have happened in just two years. Lots of more prizes. Funders are coming to help me do the conservation work in Madagascar. And we've started several new projects. It's been great. So how has the Indianapolis Prize helped push that work forward? Well, first of all, it's just the, the media attention really does make a difference. And so I've been talking more because people have asked me to invite me. I've, uh, I've become a visiting scholar for Phi Beta Kappa. I've become a distinguished professor. And, and uh, other things too. It's just been a cascade of exciting adventures. Why do you think it's important for us to study and preserve lemurs? You know, lemurs are only found on the island of Madagascar. And where I study them, which is in rainforest, um, they are part of the important ecosystem dynamics. They do all the seed dispersal, they do all the pollination, they make that rainforest possible. But lemurs, lemurs are only found in Madagascar, and if we don't help save them and preserve them, it's going to be uh, they're, it's going to be curtains for them. So what we are looking for is to save them into the future. And we're all working together to do that with the people, with the government, with, uh, with lots of students. And hopefully you'll come too and help us out. So people in Indianapolis are watching this right now and you know, Madagascar is thousands of miles away. Why should we care about an animal species that just lives on that island? Yes, lemurs are only found in Madagascar and why would somebody from Indianapolis wanna, want to save them? Well, they're a part, they're a special part of our past. You know, they are kind of our ancient primate cousins. There's a lot of things that lemurs can do that will, I think, help us in the future. Like, did you know that there are some lemurs in Paris that got Alzheimer's, plaques, and tangles like we get? And, you know, how do they do that? Why do they do that? Is one of the things I'm studying actually in the wild. They also, you know, some of the lemurs can gain double their weight in one year and lose it and then double it again. How are they able to do that so easily? It's important for us to know. So we're looking at a lot of the genetics of lemurs and we're looking at their specialization and what they're doing. And I think we're going to be able to, to help people even in Indianapolis with uh, medical problems in the future because of the things that we've learned about lemurs. Go ahead and have some fun bringing awareness to saving animals. Take a selfie with your pet, or if you're at the zoo with an animal, how about a lemur? Now tweet it with the hashtag SavingSpecies. 
We want you to understand how these conservation efforts actually help your lives. So we're going to talk with the man who heads up the Indianapolis Zoo and get some hometown perspective on the efforts here at home and those taking place half a world away. And what animal does your personality match? We have a fun little quiz to find out which animal you would be and I'll reveal my match when we come back. All right, we're here with Michael Crowther on a beautiful day at the zoo. And you've been here for 14 years now at the Indianapolis Zoo, and, and things have changed a little bit. It's not just about coming out and looking at animals at the zoo. The zoo fills another purpose. You're right, John. Um, everything about us is about conservation. And uh, the good news is we've discovered that we can give people an incredible time while we're also engaging, enlightening, and empowering them. So. Uh, so people come out here to have fun and before they know it they've become conservationists. Now the Indianapolis Prize is something that you give every two years but it's going on every day here the conservation effort is is constant. It is. Um, we have a, a bunch of areas that, where we have expertise and some of it is in the labs or in the fields such as in Namibia or in uh, Tanzania and but we also have expertise in the education areas and we have expertise in raising funds so what we're constantly trying to do is find the way that we can have the biggest and most positive impact on conservation now the Indianapolis prize every two years that's that's a big part of this isn't it it is uh, there's no question it's the world's leading award for animal conservation for for the conservation community it's like the the Oscars and the Super Bowl and the Nobel Prize all rolled into one and uh, it's something that the professional community really looks forward to. Now I understand that the professional community looks forward to it and it is a big deal in the uh -huh. conservation circles but but how does it help the the goal of conservation? I think that the unique thing about the Indianapolis Prize is that it identifies not just people who try hard but people who succeed. If you're an Indianapolis Prize finalist or a winner, you actually have learned how to make a difference and how to change the future. So the prize helps find those people and then it elevates them. It gives them bigger audiences and of course it gives them some money that they can uh, use to keep doing what they're doing. Dr. Steve Amstrup, who is uh, the guy who basically got polar bears on the endangered species list, said that it was very nice to get the money but the biggest thing being a prize winner did for him was giving him a taller pulpit from which to preach. He could get his message across to so many more people once he was known as the winner of the Indianapolis Prize. Right. Michael Crowder, the president of the Indianapolis Zoo, thank you very much. Well, thank you, John. Sometimes the biggest problem in conservation can be addressed by going small, like with these seahorses. That's what Amanda Vincent does. She's found a way to help the ecosystem of the world's oceans on the backs of some of the smallest creatures who live there. My favorite times are always when I'm in the ocean. Every little step forward brings me delight. And every new opportunity just makes me feel really excited about what we can still do. The very first things that we learned about seahorses in the oceans come from Amanda's pioneering research. In doing that, she brought the magical world of the seahorse above water. Amanda Vincent was the first biologist to study seahorses underwater. Beginning in the mid-1980s, she spent as much time in the ocean as she could, discovering that the tiny, mysterious fish form permanent pair bonds. I think seahorses are a very potent flagship species because they have such a readily identifiable charisma. When you reach out and tickle a seahorse's tail and it lets go and grabs onto your hand and sits there, sort of staring at you. They're so unreal, they're so mythical. As she began her research, Vincent needed a better understanding of the seahorse's threats. And she discovered one of the biggest by accident. I was walking through a street in Berlin and there was a scrolling billboard that said, seahorses are the most valuable export from the Philippines to help men with weak tails. I translate literally, you understand. 
In, in traditional Chinese health paradigm, we don't really have medicine. We always derive materials from the nature, rather than synthetic substance. A seahorse is, is one of the valuable herbs in tonifying on one's health. I went off and did detective work through much of Asia, eventually managed to map out this global trade in seahorses that was hitherto completely unknown. And before I knew what was happening, we'd stumbled on a massive trade. To help save the seahorse, Vincent had to get them recognized as a vital part of the planet's biodiversity. She successfully fought to place the seahorse and other marine fishes on the IUCN's red list. Vincent then laid the way for the listing of seahorses on sites in 2002, the first marine fish to be included in the convention since it was signed. As a consequence, the 182 signatory nations to sites are required to regulate seahorse exports for sustainability. People didn't see fish as wildlife, but Amanda changed that. That was an unbelievable watershed in marine conservation. It transformed our view of fish from being food to being biodiversity. Hello, how are you? Good, Good, Good to see you again. Good to see you. It's imperative to work with Amanda. It's a synergistic effect that we mutually survive. And I think conservation comes before commerce so that we can preserve and concentrate the overall ecology. Seahorses, I think, were probably Amanda's shrewdest move. If you reach the objective of saving seahorses, you can only achieve that by having a healthier marine habitat. In an effort to protect the seahorse and other ocean life from overfishing and habitat loss, Vincent began working with local governments and the people who make their living from the ocean to establish over 35 marine protected areas in her home country of Canada and the Philippines. If you do it right, then that community tells the next all about it and the next one is easier. That's what's made marine protected areas so common in the Philippines that villages see the benefits and they want one. When Amanda Vincent's name comes up, invariably the phrase, a force of nature, springs to somebody's lips. And it's true, Amanda has the most energy of any person I've ever met. I have no idea how Amanda does everything that she does. She's now a mom to two small children. Amanda has already protected every species of seahorse in the world. And I think the legacy will be to focus on the oceans and focus on the fish, but never leave the people behind. She's always the one to say, we are trying to make a difference, and it's the people that have to do it. Amanda says, just as all water flows to the sea, everything we do affects the ocean. She may be devoted to protecting seahorses, but she's also helping people understand how the smallest species can have such a big impact on the rest of the ocean creatures. Now we have something kind of fun, an animal match game. Which animal are you? Are you most like a seahorse, a Mauritius kestrel, a snow leopard, a penguin, a musk ox, or a sea turtle? Those are all the animals the Indianapolis Prize finalists are studying and saving. Answer six simple questions, and you'll see which animal is your match. Now, by the way, I apparently am a rare bird. I match with the Mauritius kestrel, known for its curiosity and loyalty to other members of the flock. Now, finalist Carl Safina knows a lot about the world's oceans, and he has a unique way of teaching the rest of us and getting us to care as well. I describe myself as a guy who likes to go fishing. Oh, you can do it. Come on. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm a guy who likes nature. I like to go look at birds, and I like to go fishing, and I like to be in the coast, and I like to be in the forest. You got yours. He's an avid fisherman. He, he interacts with fishermen. He wants to make sure that we are protecting um, our resources so that they'll be around for the future. I always say it was part of his DNA. He was born with all that love. My husband imparted all of that because he was a nature lover. He gave that to Carl. It was always about nature. Even though he was born in the center of Brooklyn, Carl Safina's love of the outdoors inspired an unexpected pathway to conservation. 
With a PhD in ecology, Safina spent the first part of his career fighting illegal waterway dumping and unsustainable fishing practices, leading to a landmark ban on the high seas drift nets and also a rewrite of the U.S. federal fisheries law. In 1990, he founded the Living Oceans Program for the National Audubon Society, became a MacArthur Fellow, and one of the 100 notable conservationists of the 20th century. But it's his way with words where Safina has made his mark, writing seven books so far on the issues that threaten the natural world. In my writing, I'm not trying to give people science lessons. What I try to do is I try to make sure that the reader is really right there with me and feeling it along with me. That's what you want. You want people who personify and, 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 and translate facts into emotive experiences. And I think that's something that Carl does better than almost anybody I know. They swim fast, they swim hard, but only about one in a thousand is going to actually survive. One in a thousand? Yeah. Wow, I hope you didn't hear that. Just do your best, OK? He sings the sea. I think it's because he deeply loves nature and loves the ocean. Carl expresses that love extremely genuinely. I mean, the only way to accurately try to get this across in words is to try to combine the factual science of it and what's happening with the sheer poetry of the, of the actual beauty of it. If I had to pick one person on this planet to represent me in the human court of public opinion, I think I would choose Carl Safina, because I think he's that good of a communicator and a storyteller. What I don't want to do today is I don't want to do a presentation. I want to take the opportunity to have a conversation. Carl founded the Safina Center in 2003, giving him a platform to inspire critical conservation values around the world. He has worked to apply international agreements to help restore depleted populations of tuna, swordfish, and sharks. Safina's 2010 book on the Deepwater Horizon oil blowout in the Gulf of Mexico continues to influence environmental advocates for the oversight of ocean-based oil wells. Carl's work has been invaluable in sort of building um, current ocean conditions into long-term historical context. And once people have a grasp on just how little is left, it gives us some passion to be able to at least retain what we have. He, in every pore and every um, neuron, is constantly focused on the wonders of the natural world and what he can do to help sustain them for future generations. Yeah, he's a simple guy. A lot of it has to do with humility. He doesn't push you. He puts you in a position to push yourself. He's a, he's a good teacher. I am just stunned where his life has taken him, what he's achieved. I wish that my husband could be alive today to see the accomplishments where Carl has gone with everything that he loved to do in his life. He'd be bursting. Although Carl would describe himself simply as a guy who likes to go fishing, his science is helping teach people about the living world and what is really at stake. For him, it's all about sustaining the oceans for the future. Now, we can all help these conservation heroes. Their unified message is that awareness is the key. Prize finalist Dee Borsma says it simply. It's individuals telling another individual. All of us can do something. It just depends on what you want to do. You have to have a passion for something. The conservationists have found their passion. Now, start looking for yours. You can read about the organization they work for on the Indianapolis Prize website, indianapolisprize.org. Now, Dee took her words of wisdom to heart and acted on them. She's a champion of conservation for penguins that live close to the equator. You'll see why she's one of the world's foremost experts on the challenges to their habitat. Dee is tough. That's just a fact of life. She is remarkably enthusiastic and restless. You're perfect. OK, hold still, Eagle. She's able to do all of the governmental relations and soft communication and people skills that are required to get conservation accomplished on the ground. But she's really driven by the quality of science. Have you got any other questions about penguins? I'm heavy into penguins. She's extremely well known for this 30-year-plus data set that she has on Magellanic penguins in South America. Dee is quite a remarkable person. 
which is why we have detailed demographic data on the penguins at Punta Tombo. It's one of the best of any wild animal anywhere. Since the early 1970s, Dee Borsma has used a mix of innovative science and persuasion to save penguins. She has worked virtually nonstop in the Galapagos Islands and Punta Tombo, Argentina, home of the world's largest population of Magellanic penguins. It was there she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with local government and corporations that were harvesting the birds for their oil and skin, which can be used to make leather. I couldn't believe that anybody was going to harvest, you know, Medjool Lake penguins. And so I went down to determine what was the population size at Punta Tombo and could they harvest penguins in a sustainable manner? And of course, the answer to that, I knew before I went, no, you can't do that. Field work at Punta Tombo revealed another threat to the penguins from oil dumped at sea. Borsma's efforts persuaded the local government to move oil tanker lanes further offshore. Decades of work led to the establishment of Marine Protected Area at Punta Tombo, a historic achievement that will protect vital ocean feeding grounds. Using penguins as a marker has become Borsma's trademark for creating change and protecting ecosystems. are really ocean sentinels and they tell us a lot about the environment whether it's the terrestrial environment or the marine environment and what penguins do is tell you a lot of these problems before you even really recognize it they're sensitive to changes in the environment whether that's pollution from oil or overfishing because these birds nest on land but depend entirely for their food supply on fish and other organisms in the ocean they are indicators of ocean health, but we can observe them on land. Sea levels, of course, because of global climate change are rising. We're getting more severe storms. Penguins nest really close to the beaches. So some of the nests that were suitable 40 years ago are now gone. Dee is famous for getting her hands dirty. She ends up hauling literally tons of lava rock to build these huts, which serve as artificial caves for Galapagos penguins to nest, and it's been very successful in attracting nesting Galapagos penguins. Despite decades of hands-on effort, Dee's energy shows no sign of waning and still has her conducting field studies in the Galapagos and Point to Tombo for months each year, fighting to protect areas where the penguins live and passing down knowledge to students. One of the things she's most proud of is her students, um, and you see them going out to uh, make an independent conservation difference. I think that's her, her greatest legacy is the scientist she's trained. What we're really looking for is to see how fast these guys age. I look at her as a real world leader in the sense of Carl Sagan, you know, the kind of broad out view that she passes on to her, all these students in a very wonderful way. If we can tell young bird, middle-aged birds, and old birds, that means we can go to a colony and ask, is this a relatively young colony, or is this an old colony? D is the ambassador for those organisms that share the planet with us. They don't have a voice unless one of us gives them a voice. D has been a powerful voice for them. I think the only thing that gets changed in the world is what individuals change. All of us can do something. I want to check those nests. Seeing it is believing it for me. And those penguins give the energy back. Dee brings a relentless spirit to all she does for these charismatic seabirds. And she continues to propel research and conservation education both in the classroom and in the field. You know, all of these Indianapolis Prize finalists and the winner, Carl Jones, were honored at a gala event. We'll take you there when we come back. I'm here with the 2016 Indianapolis Prize winner, Carl Jones. Congratulations. Thank you very much. So what are your expectations now after winning the Indianapolis Prize? I don't think I have any great expectations, but it's really nice to have recognition for the work I do. You know, the previous prize winners are my heroes, and to think that people are now associating me with those is wonderful. But what I think is really quite nice is that I've spent my career working with animals that most people have never heard of. 
I've been working with very obscure species, small lizards and various birds and so on. And I think this is showing the great maturity of the Indianapolis Prize, that it's beginning to recognize that biodiversity out there is just wonderful. And you don't have to be working on pandas or elephants to win the Indianapolis Prize. And to me, I think that's very special. And you have been very successful in your career. It's been well documented what it is that you've been able to accomplish. Did you ever have a shadow of doubt in your mind that you would be able to do that and when you began? We have nine species. We have five birds, three reptiles and a fruit bat that would probably be extinct if it wasn't for the work that we'd done. Of course, I could never know I could, have, I could have never known that we could have saved nine species, but I always believed that the endangered species we were working with were saveable and there was a lot that we could do. We've achieved more than I ever expected, but I always believed we could achieve a lot. But we're not ending here. You're going to move forward, too. How do you think the Indianapolis Prize is going to help you move forward in your work? It's giving recognition for what we do, and I think this is quite important. There's a lot of doom and gloom in the world. A lot of people think that a lot of the problems out there are unsolvable. But I think the Indianapolis Prize is showing that there are solutions. We don't necessarily know what they all are at the moment, but if we look hard enough, we can find answers for some of the big environmental pro problems in the world. And what the Indianapolis Prize is showing, that there is great hope for megavertebrates, like your polar bears and your pandas, but also for your small, obscure species, such as some of the ones I work on. And it's not just about the animals and the environments, it's about the people, too. It has to work for the people that live near the animals and in those environments. Of course it does. And what's interesting is when you actually work with individual species, it drives a much bigger agenda. Bigger agenda of community involvement, working with the people, but also in restoring whole ecosystems. And some of the work that I've done, I started working with individual critically endangered species, that work has now moved on so that we're restoring whole islands and whole ecosystems. And that is a great message for hope. In the future, we will be rebuilding a lot of the damaged earth, rebuilding systems. The rebuilding takes years of tireless work by conservationists like Carl Jones and all of the Indianapolis Prize finalists. This gala at the JW Marriott celebrates all of these heroes of conservation. Right now, we're at the VIP reception where the finalists are mingling with some of the donors. This event brings some of the world's most respected conservationists together in one room. We have some incredible minds and visionaries here. One of the special guests is actress Sigourney Weaver, who is receiving the Jane Alexander Global Wildlife Ambassador Award. You probably know Sigourney from movies like Ghostbusters and more recently, a memorable part in Finding Dory. But it was her role in the 1988 film Gorillas in the Mist, where she played primatologist Diane Fossey, that triggered Sigourney's passion for conservation. She's now the honorary chair of the Diane Fossey Gorilla International Fund. Sigourney has worked for years carrying on Fossey's passion and sharing the story of mountain gorillas and their struggle for survival. It is something close to her heart. You know, I, I was entrusted with the role of Diane Fossey now about you know, 30 years ago. And to, to be given the opportunity to spend so much time with uh, the mountain gorillas, I think it changed my whole perspective. and and kind of taught me that we were not the species on the planet, but one of many. And, um, and that is a message that a lot of people haven't kind of received. You know, they think it's ours to do what we want with. And I, I think that um, it's actually a very natural thing for everyone to kind of look around and go, well, there's a real inequality here. And we're taking, you know, habitat and, and uh, uh, the balance away from so many uh, other beings and um, to do something about it. So this is one night, it's a, it's a great celebration, but it doesn't end here for you. This is not an end in itself. No, actually, I, I very much feel it's a beginning. I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've been given a quest by Dame Jane, and now I have to go out and, uh, and, and do more. Um, I've always worked with the, with the Fosse Fund for now about 30 years. Um, but you end up, you know, in my job, going all over the world and, and learning so much about uh, what's going on. And so I hope to broaden my, my reach. Actress Sigourney Weaver and the Indianapolis Zoo's Michael Crowther probably said it best. He said Sigourney is both a force of nature and a force for nature. If you want to read more about mountain gorillas and find out what you can do to help ensure their survival, 
we have a link to the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International website at WTHR.com. Now we want you to meet Luigi. He's a harpy eagle, critically endangered in many parts of the world and nearly extinct in Central America. Luigi's here in honor of Carl Jones, whose work is founded on a foundation of the love of birds. Carl will accept his Indianapolis Prize Award in just a moment and will take you inside the spectacular celebration. One of the most inspirational things that I've ever heard came from Carl Jones a couple of years ago when he said, how do we get people to be inspired about nature and to act? He said, get out into your backyard. Get out into your local green belt. Experience nature and begin to realize that wherever you are, you're a part of nature. This spectacular gala brings together all of the finalists for the Indianapolis Prize. And we want to share some of the night's best moments with you. The 2016 Indianapolis Prize finalists. Today's conservationists are preparing our legacy for our children and our grandchildren. They're establishing the textures of our landscapes, the color and the clarity of our skies and waters, and the sounds that will sweeten our lives. Today's conservationists are our knights, our champions. Individuals can and do make a difference. It is not committees. It is not committees and organizations that create change, but people with drive and vision who can work with others and develop collaborations. All species are savable, but there is no quick fix, and it takes decades. Small steps can be the start of a great journey. We hope the stories of Carl Jones, Dee Borsma, Joel Berger, Carl Safina, Amanda Vincent and Rodney Jackson will inspire future scientists, future conservationists, and simply people who care. Between the spectacular video and the straight from the heart work these conservationists are doing, we've shared some remarkable stories tonight. And we're sure you'll want to know more about their work and what you can do to help. You can watch all of their stories at WTHR.com. Follow the hope that each of their stories showcases, and then find out what you can do to make a difference and inspire change. Thanks for being with us. Good night.